So hello and welcome to today's info to go webinar. My name is Annie Gaines and I am the continuing education consultant here at the Idaho Commission for Libraries located in sunny Boise, Idaho. Our webinars and other continuing education opportunities are funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Everyone is muted and we encourage you to use the chat feature to ask questions and discuss with other attendees. As you exit the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete an evaluation. And as always, we appreciate your honest feedback. Today's topic is what does obscene or harmful to minors mean exactly? And our presenter is Associate Professor of Law, Benjamin Cover. Thank you so much for being here, Professor. Please take it away. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate you, Annie Gaines, and the Idaho Commission for Libraries inviting me. Um, and it's wonderful. And I wanna uh, thank everybody um, who's tuning in. Thanks so much for joining us. This is an amazing group of people. Um, and it's really cool just to see, I'm just scrolling through the chat and seeing uh, where people are from. This is awesome. Um, I, I'm gonna try to share my screen, make sure that that's going okay. Okay, do we have screen share going on? Okay, um, you know, thank you all so much. It's really an honor and a and a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I personally love libraries and I love librarians. Uh, my wife and I have three kids, uh, ages 11, nine, and six. Um, and we love going to public libraries. My kids love taking books out of public libraries, and they love those books so much that they almost never return them on time, uh, which gives my wife and I an opportunity to contribute to the public library uh, through late fees. Um, but jokes aside, sincerely, I I, uh, I want to thank each of you for everything that you do every day. Um, I, I really appreciate it, um, and I'm really excited to be here um, and to be chatting with you. Uh, our topic today, what does obscene mean? What does harmful to minors mean exactly? Um, I should start with a spoiler alert and a couple disclaimers. The spoiler alert is that I don't know exactly what it means, and I don't think anybody knows exactly what it means. Um, and part of the discussion today uh, will be, you know, describing the relevant legal framework. And I think one of the key things about the legal framework is that it, it's hard to say uh, for a given book in advance uh, with certainty whether or not it will be deemed to fall within one of these categories. Um, and that relates to two disclaimers. One is, you know, obviously I can't provide any uh, legal advice. Um, the other is that, um, as Annie said, I'm a professor at the University of Idaho College of Law, uh, but any views that I share today are solely my own and are, I'm not speaking on behalf of the University of Idaho. Um, okay, um, let's dive in um, and let's start with one of my favorite books, uh, the U.S. Constitution, uh, and one of uh, one of the best passages, the First Amendment. It's forty-five words. Uh, it fits in a tweet, um, and it's here for you on the screen. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Uh, what exactly does this mean? How do we interpret the Constitution generally, the First Amendment uh, in particular? You know, there's, there's different ways we can try to understand the First Amendment. There's just a literal reading, just start with those 45 words and ask the question, what, what exactly does the First Amendment say? Uh, there's kind of a popular understanding of the First Amendment. Uh, we might ask the question, what do people say about the First Amendment? Um, when I'm teaching constitutional law uh, here at the University of Idaho, I focus on constitutional doctrine. You know, I, I ask the question, what does the Supreme Court of the United States say about the First Amendment? Um, and one thing that's really interesting about the First Amendment is that the, the first, first Amendment constitutional doctrine, what the Supreme Court says about the First Amendment, 
uh, sometimes it lines up really nicely with a literal reading and with the popular understanding of the First Amendment. Sometimes uh, it departs significantly from a literal reading of the First Amendment or from a popular understanding of the First Amendment. Uh, to demonstrate that, let's briefly review four things about the First Amendment. Uh, so first of all, um, the very first word of the First Amendment is Congress. Congress shall make no law. And so a literal reading of the First Amendment might think that this uh, only constrains the legislative branch of the federal government. But uh, the US Supreme Court has interpreted the First Amendment uh, to apply to all branches of the federal government and also to apply to state and local government as well uh, through something called the doctrine of incorporation. The idea that after the Civil War, uh, when the uh, Reconstruction Amendments were passed, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments uh, were ratified. Um, the 14th Amendment has a due process clause, says no state shall uh, deny due process of law. Um, and the Supreme Court has interpreted those words to basically take uh, most of the Bill of Rights, including the First Amendment, which was originally drafted to constrain the federal government and to apply those same rights, those same constraints, against state and local governments as well. So we the literal text starts with the word Congress, uh, but it's now, uh, you know, it's now clear constitutional doctrine that every first year student learns that the First Amendment uh, equally applies to all branches of government and all levels of government, federal, state, and local. Um, however, the First Amendment only applies to government. Uh, you know, so people say all the time, Twitter is violating the First Amendment, Facebook is violating the First Amendment. Um, it, as a technical legal matter, that's impossible because the First Amendment does not govern what Facebook or Twitter does. It only governs what uh, what the federal government does or what state and local governments do. Um, they might be acting in a way that undermines certain norms we have, certain, uh, it might undermine the spirit of, of free speech, but it's not literally violating the First Amendment because the First Amendment doesn't constrain private actors like Twitter and Facebook. Um, if you, if we go back and we look at the, the text again, um, you know, there's six rights or clauses in the First Amendment. There's two related to religion. So no establishment of religion, but also uh, 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 clause for the free exercise of religion. Then there's the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press clauses. And then there's the right to assemble and the right to petition. So we got six things, non-establishment, free exercise, freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, right to assemble, right to petition. Note that nowhere there does it talk about the right of association. And yet the US Supreme Court has repeatedly said that the First Amendment um, includes a right of expressive association. Um, so you have a right to choose who you want to associate with and who you don't want to associate with, positive association and negative association. Um, and that's protected by the First Amendment, just like those other rights. So sometimes there's something that's, that's not literally in the text, uh, that gets added to the bundle of First Amendment rights. We would call that an unenumerated right. Uh, but conversely, we also have uh, unprotected categories of speech. They're not, uh, they're not described in the literal text of the First Amendment, uh, but the U.S. Supreme Court has long held that there are certain categories of speech that, based on historical understandings and other uh, other policy reasons, they're just not part of the speech that is protected by the First Amendment. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of our discussion. Obviously, we're thinking about obscenity and uh, material that's harmful to minors, and we're thinking about it at a time when there's been a lot of increased scrutiny and controversy about what materials are available to children at public libraries. Um, and I see that there's a few things in the chat. Um, I'm just checking, you know, so I'm going to try to leave about half an hour at the end for Q&A. Um, but if anybody has a burning question uh, in real time, as, uh, if there's something that I'm saying that's not clear, please feel free to add it to the chat. Okay, so there are certain categories of unprotected speech. 
Um, three of them relate to sex, obscenity, material deemed harmful to minors, and child pornography. Um, and I, I'm going to discuss each one of these, starting with obscenity. Um, what does obscenity mean? This is Justice John Marshall Harlan II. Um, he said the subject of obscenity has produced a variety of views among the members of the court unmatched in any, any other course of constitutional adjudication. So, you know, we don't always get nine zero unanimous opinions from the Supreme Court. Uh, we all we sometimes get a majority and a dissent. We sometimes get different justices concurring with their own theories of the best way to interpret the Constitution. Uh, but according to Justice John Marshall Harlan, uh, when it comes to obscenity, you know, this is this area beats any other area in terms of just the, the huge variety of opinions that we get. Um, in the 50s and the 60s, as the U.S. Supreme Court was trying to figure out a test for obscenity, there was a period where there were 13 opinions decided in about a decade, and those 13 opinions produced 55 separate writings by different members of the court, sometimes writing just for themselves or for them and a few of their colleagues, none of those opinions getting a, a, a five-justice majority. But, you know, and during this period, uh, this is Justice Potter Stewart. Um, he famously said, uh, with respect to the definition of obscenity, I know it when I see it, um, which is not very helpful, uh, especially since Justice Potter Stewart has passed away. And so we can't ask him anymore whether something is obscenity or not. Uh Ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court settled on a test for obscenity that commanded a majority of the justices on the court. In a case called Miller versus California in 1973, people call this the Miller test. Um, and it's got three parts and each part is necessary. Um, so here's the Miller test. Um, first, you have to ask whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest. And after I lay this out, I'm going to go through each element and talk about exactly what that means. Two, we ask whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law. Note that that, that second piece really has two things going on. Uh, it's it's asking whether it's offensive or patently offensive, but it's also requiring some specificity in, in the applicable state law saying, what exactly are we talking about here? And then the third element looks at, at, at the value of the work, asks whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. The idea being that if it has serious value, that redeems the work and takes it outside the category of obscenity. So this is the Miller test, three elements and they're conjunctive. So each one needs to be satisfied in order for the work to qualify as obscenity. It needs to appeal to, per, to the prurient interest in a way that's patently offensive and it needs to have low or no value. Um, let's look at each element in turn. The prurient interest, um, what does the word prurient mean? If, if you look at the relevant US Supreme Court cases, they gesture at several different definitions of this word prurient. Uh, one is having a tendency to excite lustful thoughts. Uh, another is a shameful or morbid interest in nudity, sex, or excretion. Uh, that's the definition that was used in the California statute that was at issue in the California versus Miller case. The California legislature got that language from the model penal code, which was drafted by uh, the American Law Institute as kind of a recommendation to states on how you draft an obscenity statute. But um, note here that the when determining if the work appeals to the prurient interest, you must consider the work taken as a whole. Um, this was a change from the approaches used prior to Miller versus California, where courts would sometimes just look at an individual snippet in a book and say, well, this sentence or this paragraph uh, appeals to the prurient interest, and so uh, the, the work is obscene. 
you can't just take isolated pieces of it. You need to consider the work as a whole when you're analyzing this first element. And you need to uh, think about the average person applying contemporary community standards. Again, this is, this is narrower and more protective of speech than prior approaches, which tended to focus on the most sensitive person in the community. Um, this doesn't focus on the most sensitive person. This focuses on the average person. Okay. The second element requires that the work depicts or describes sexual conduct specifically defined by applicable state law in a patently offensive way. And the court uh, in Miller versus California said, we'll give you some examples uh, of the sort of thing that the statute could define with specificity, representation or descriptions of ultimate sexual acts, normal or perverted, actual or simulated. That's the quote from the Supreme Court opinion in 1973, representation or descriptions of masturbation, excretory functions and lewd exhibition of genitals. Um, but even if those first two elements are satisfied, you also need to satisfy the third element that it has no or low value. Uh, again, you have to take the work as a whole. And it needs to lack serious value, literary, artistic, political, or scientific. Um, the court noted that a medical book, for example, might include a graphic depiction of human anatomy, but that has serious uh, scientific or educational value. And so that would not be considered obscene. Okay, um, so we get this Miller test. Ultimately, it's applied by a jury at a criminal trial, but it's subject to independent appellate review uh, by appellate courts. The first two elements, whether the pruriency and the offensiveness elements are not based on national standards, they're based on local community standards. Um, and that community does not include children, but it does include sensitive adults. So when you're looking at the first two elements, you think about the, the average community of adults, including less sensitive and more sensitive adults, but you exclude children. Um, the Supreme Court has struggled with and has not uh, fully settled the question of whether you can apply some sort of local standard for material on the internet. Um, but the court has clarified that the third element, the question of whether the material lacks serious value, that's not based on the local community. That's based on an objective reasonableness standard. Um, and you're going to see that come up again when we try to fi figure out what exactly does this mean to say that a book is um, not obscene, but harmful to minors. You're going to see this, this objective value concept come up again. Okay, so that was the Miller test. Um, then there's this other case called Ginsburg versus New York, um, where the court held that a state can prohibit distribution to minors, specifically, of material that is obscene for minors, specifically. Um, the quote from the case, the state may adjust the definition of obscenity to social realities by permitting the appeal of this type of material to be assessed in terms of the sexual interest of such minors. Um, and really what the, what the court elaborated was saying, we're gonna use the same test. And this eventually gets combined with the Miller test. So we get the same three-part test that has the same three elements of prurience, offensiveness, and, and value or low, no value. But each element is modified to apply to minors. And so some people call this the Miller-Ginsburg test or the harmful to minors test. Um, and note that you could think of this as a, as a second category of unprotected speech. You could think there's obscenity over here and there's harmful to minors over here. Or another way to think about it that's conceptually equivalent is that what we're doing is we're taking the regular obscenity test and we're applying it specifically to minors. Um, but you still have to satisfy the three elements of this test. So we would say the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest of minors. The work depicts or describes sexual conduct specifically defined by state law in a way that is patently offensive for minors. And 
the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value for minors. Um, in the Ginsburg case, uh, the defendant sold what was referred to in the opinion as a girly magazine to a 16 year old. Uh, the girly magazine was called Sir. And in prior cases approved by the US Supreme Court, that magazine Sir was held to not be obscene for adults. So it did not satisfy the obscenity test for adults. But the court said that it could satisfy this modified test for minors. This is the concept of variable obscenity. The idea that the, the same book, uh, whether this book is obscene depends on its audience. And so this book may be obscene for children, but not obscene for adults. Um, that means that the state can punish the distribution of this book to children, but the state cannot punish distribution of this book to adults. Because with respect to adults, if it's not obscene, if it's not within that narrow category of unprotected speech, then it's protected by the First Amendment. Then adults have a First Amendment right to distribute it to other adults and to view it and read it themselves. So this concept of variable obscenity creates this really interesting situation where you have a single book um, and the state can prohibit its distribution of children, but cannot uh, prohibit its distribution to adults. Okay, the third category I wanna just briefly mention is child pornography. And I wanna clarify that this is a distinct category of unprotected speech. And the key to child pornography is that it actually involves child actors or child or children are literally involved in the sexual conduct. Um, not youthful adults pretending to be children, not some computer animation that is simulating uh, a, a real child, but a real live child. And the reason why child pornography is a separate unprotected category is because if it involves real children in the sexual conduct, then it, it necessarily involves the abuse and exploitation of children. Um, for that reason, child pornography is treated differently than obscenity. So, for example, in a famous case called Stanley versus Georgia, the court said that uh, adults have a privacy interest in their own home. The state can't prosecute you for possessing obscene materials in your own home, but the state can prosecute you for possessing child pornography in your home. Because in the case of obscene materials, the harm is related to how the materials affect you. But when it comes to the separate category of child pornography, the harm is related to the abuse and exploitation of the children that were involved in the making of that child pornography and trying to uh, trying to limit demand for child pornography to reduce the supply of child pornography uh, by prosecuting anybody who possesses child pornography, even a person uh, doing it in, in their own home. Okay. That's all I'm going to say about child pornography, because, you know, in this context, when we're thinking about what materials are um, are available to children um, or adults in libraries, it, we're not talking about child pornography, but we might be considering whether a book does or does not fall within the category of material deemed harmful to minors. So let's return to the Miller-Ginsburg test. Um, so, and I'm just, I'm checking the chat now and I'm seeing, um, so, you know, what is the definition of a sensitive adult? Um, so that the court used the term sensitive adult in terms of, uh, two things. When we're thinking about those two elements, the, the, the prurient, uh, element and the offensiveness element, um, we're thinking about, um, a sensitive adult is somebody who might be more readily offended, um, or a sensitive adult might be somebody who might more readily have a prurient response to, uh, to the work. So the three, yeah, the three categories, uh, there's obscenity, there's child pornography, 
And then there's uh, material deemed harmful to minors. And harmful to minors is the same thing as obscenity for minors. It's the obscenity test adjusted for an audience of minors. Okay. Um, and so the test for harmful to minors, it's that same three element test for obscenity, uh, but it's adjusted for minors. So we're asking whether it appeals to the prurient interest of minors, whether it's patently offensive uh, to show this to minors and whether it lacks value for minors. Um, what exactly does this mean? Um, well, we get some idea of what this means um, by looking at the case of Virginia versus American Booksellers Association. Um, this is the, the closest the US Supreme Court has gotten to wrestling with what does it mean to say that something is harmful to minors. Um, and what happened in this case is the, the state of Virginia passed a statute. It made it unlawful to knowingly display for commercial purpose um, in a manner where juveniles may examine and peruse visual or written material that depicts sexually explicit nudity, sexual conduct, or sadomasochistic abuse, and which is harmful to juveniles. Note it uses the term juveniles here rather than minors. Um, it's not clear that that, uh, had, you can think of those two as just synonyms. Uh, that doesn't change the analysis. Um, that's what the relevant provision said. So Virginia adopted this provision in the, in the 80s, and booksellers were worried about what exactly does this mean? Does this mean that I can't have any book in my bookstore that's publicly displayed on a, on a bookshelf, which uh, might satisfy that test for any child of any age. Um, if that's true, how many books would that sweep in? Um, how much of the bookstore would, would get me in trouble here? And so you had a bunch of booksellers uh, that filed a lawsuit and they identified 16 books that they were worried would be covered by this statute. Um, the trial court uh, had a trial, found that they thought that five to 25% of the bookstore might be covered. Um, the trial court said that this is going too far. It violates the First Amendment rights of adults who might enter that bookstore and wanna be able to access those materials um, and said that Virginia can't enforce the law uh, the appellate court, the, the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, agreed with the trial court, and it went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And instead of deciding the case, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, sent some questions to the Virginia Supreme Court. They said, this is a state statute. We're not sure exactly what it means. And so we're going to ask the Virginia Supreme Court to clarify for us what the, this Virginia statute means. And the U.S. Supreme Court specifically asked, these 16 books, are they actually covered by the statute? Um, and how does the standard apply when you might have kids of varying ages? You know, do we, you know, do we ask, do we apply that three-part test thinking about a 17-year-old or a 12-year-old or a seven-year-old? Or how does this work? Uh, here were the 16 books, um, Changing Bodies, Changing Lives, uh, the book Forever by Judy Bloom, um, Ulysses, Our Bodies Ourselves, uh, the Penguin Book of Love Poetry, Where Do Babies Come From, and The Witches of Eastwick. And this is what the Virginia Supreme Court said. They said they didn't address the first two factors at all. Um, they said that that's for a jury to determine whether it, whether uh, any of these books appeal to the prurient interest, where, whether any of these books are patently offensive. But the value question, the question of whether this lacks serious uh, value, artistic, literary, scientific value, um, that is an objective, reasonable question that's subject to appellate review. And so we as a court can answer that question here and now without waiting for a jury. And we can say that in order to be uh, considered harmful to minors as a class, um, this needs to lack 
uh, serious value for a legitimate minority of normal older adolescents. So they said, we're not going to focus on the youngest kids. Um, we're going to think about some of the older kids. And we're not going to ask if it has serious value for every single one of those older kids. We're going to ask if it has serious value for a, a significant minority of older kids. Um, yeah, and I, I'd be happy to make these slides available. Um, we can coordinate through Annie and get these slides to anybody who'd like them. I also think that this is being recorded and will be on YouTube and so people can access um, that stuff that way. Okay. Um, and then the Virginia Supreme Court said, we looked through all 16 of these books and not there and for there's not a single one of these books where we can say that it lacks serious value for at least a legitimate minority of normal older adolescents um and so for that reason none of these books would fall under the definition of harmful to juveniles now um this kind of helps us think through the, the sorts of questions we need to ask when we're trying to analyze the category of harmful to juveniles. But, you know, note that this doesn't answer all questions um, because the, the issue here was, it was about displaying a book to the public, to anybody who came into the bookstore or the analogy would be, the equivalent would be anyone who comes into the library. It doesn't answer the question, well, what if a particular kid uh, wants to buy a particular book. At that point, does the test change and does it, do you focus on the age of the particular child that's buying the book? Um, so to trans, you know, so, you know, going back to the three-part test, the court said, look, the first two elements, that's for a jury to decide. We're not even going to go there. Um, but in order to, to satisfy uh, this definition, you need to satisfy all three elements. And the last element, the idea that it lacks serious value, that is an objective reasonableness inquiry that courts can do. And we think that every single one of these has significant value for at least some older kids. And so you can display it in a bookstore. They did not ask the next question, and, and this question is where I'm going to transition from the like the lecture piece of this discussion to the Q&A. Um, the next question, and they, they, the Virginia Supreme Court didn't address this and the U.S. Supreme Court didn't address this, um, is what if a particular kid wants to buy one of these books or in the in the context of a library wants to take out one of these books? At that point, how do you analyze whether it is harmful to minors? Um, do you have to consider the age of the individual child that's trying to get the book? Um, what if you're not sure the age of the child? Do you have to ask the age of the child? What if the child doesn't tell you, you know, tells you that what if they answer honestly or they don't answer honestly? Um, you can, it, there's a lot of questions you could ask at that point about how to implement some standard of whether something is harmful to uh, juveniles. Possibly for that reason, uh, you know, Idaho and many other states, they make it a crime to, to distribute to a child uh, material that's harmful to juveniles, but they have an exception um, for, uh, for libraries and for others, um, for bona fide educators and librarians. Um, and then, and I'm just speaking in my own, my own personal view here, that makes a lot of sense, um, because it seems to me that the whole point of libraries is to try to have materials that have value, have educational, scientific, literary, artistic, political value, uh, to the public at large. And so it's unlikely that there's going to be a very large number of um, materials in there that are going to meet the adult definition of obscenity. Um, because I think, I don't think they're, they're going to, whatever you think about the first two elements, I don't, I think it's unlikely they're going to meet the third element. And then when you think about harmful to minors, if, if you have to, if a librarian has to, 
take into account the individual characteristics of every child who comes to a library requesting a book, um, that could be extraordinarily difficult for librarians and it could have a really chilling effect on what books librarians would feel comfortable making available to kids. Um, it seems to me that there's other ways that we can try to address concerns about if, if parents don't want their kids to read certain books, how we can try to address the concerns that parents have without using the criminal law in, in this particular way. Um, and so Idaho and lots of other states have statutory exemptions. Obviously, this past legislative session, there were efforts to roll back, in, you know, depending on which bill, uh, to eliminate or to limit those uh, exceptions. And ultimately, the bill that was passed was vetoed by the governor uh, for, I think, similar concerns about the impact that it would have on libraries and librarians. Um, but, you know, I wish I could I wish I could give you a straightforward answer. Um, but I think the problem is that we don't have a straightforward answer. This is the framework that the U.S. Supreme Court has developed for us to analyze uh these questions but this framework does not provide a lot of certainty when we're thinking about a particular kid and a particular book um and so with that i'd love to open it up for q a and to, to hear what you all think or whatever questions you have and to chat with you more about it awesome well thank you so much yeah as folks are typing in your questions in the chat uh i just want to say thank you so much uh for taking the time um you've already mentioned that you're gonna share the slides which is really great um so what questions do you all have Here's a question. Uh, how does access to online content in the library differ from access to written materials legally? Is there a difference? So, I mean, the short answer is in terms of the First Amendment, in terms of the categories of obscenity or harmful to minors, it doesn't depend on the medium. And so it could be, it, you know, whether you're looking at a movie or a book, or an internet website, it would be the same constitutional analysis. However, the Congress has passed some federal statutes that has said any library across the country that's going to be getting federal taxpayer dollars, there are certain things we want you to do to basically filter uh, the internet on library computers so that children can access certain websites. And there were there were legal challenges to that, saying that that violates the First Amendment rights of adults who might want to access some of that material. Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court uh, ultimately upheld uh, some of those federal statutes. Nice. Uh, another question: What could be a way of sharing this information with concerned library patrons uh, without getting in legal trouble? Um, like specific, specifically sharing um, like this, this talk? Probably they meant um, sharing information about like what this, uh, like talking through what you just did about what obscenity means and the different standards, like uh, what the Miller test means. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so I mean, for those who are local here in Idaho, I'm I'm happy to chat with people who who have concerns and have questions, and I'm happy to talk with them, and I'm happy to kind of chat through uh, with with them the same thing that I would say to the students in my class who are learning the First Amendment. Um, uh, another question: Why is it important to take the book as a whole? Uh, if part of it is harmful, isn't that enough? You know, so um, that was the standard that was used 
in a lot of cases in the United States um, before the 1950s, 60s, and 70s when the court uh, developed new tests. And, you know, I think that the court ultimately concluded that um, if you don't take the work as a whole, if you just look at an isolated passage, an individual paragraph or an individual sentence, um, that it would significantly expand the category of obscenity. You know, and, and what we're doing is we're, we're drawing a line um, and we're saying that everything on one side of the line is not gonna be protected by the first amendment. Um, and I think the court was concerned about how many books were gonna be put into that category of obscene materials that are not protected by the first amendment. And so one of the key things, one of the key changes in the rules that protected significantly more materials and narrowed the category of obscenity uh, was to consider the work as a whole rather than just focusing on an isolated snippet or passage. Um, now, you know, if, if your goal is to have a broader category uh, of obscenity, then you should do the opposite. You should, you should adopt the, the original formulation. Um, but I think that the court at the time they were concerned about the category of obscenity getting too large. And so they were looking for a tool to narrow it. Um, next question was, uh, so in libraries, when someone asks for a book to be removed from the collection, it's called a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and so do you foresee more of those challenges uh, specifically related to comics and graphic novels because of the, the visual nature of those materials versus uh, just a standard novel? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think I, I, that seems plausible to me. Um, I could, yeah, I could, I could totally see that. Um, but I should say, you know, I, I teach con law at law school, but I'm not an expert in the, the challenge process at the local libraries, and I'd love to understand it better. Yeah, maybe uh, you could do, you could go on some visits to local libraries and see what the, yeah. the process is like. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be really interesting. That could be really fun. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a question. Um, someone is asking, are you saying that we can't get in legal trouble for having certain books in our collection? So I go back to this glimmer at the beginning that I can't provide any legal advice. Um, you know, but my understanding is that the, um, you know, the, the original state of the law before the last legal session was that there was an exemption for librarians. I mean, I, I can show you the statute. Um, And maybe, maybe I, I could try to do this in a way that also addresses another question, which is asking a specific question about I, Idaho statute and why does it say one or both of the following? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we could actually try to look at the Idaho statute. Okay, so I'm gonna try to share my computer screen. Do you see a website? It says Thomson Reuters Westlaw Precision. Yes. Okay. So you know Westlaw is just is a commercial legal database that um, allows you to search a lot of legal sources. I use this at the law school. Our students use this when they're doing legal research. Um, one thing you can do is you can look at state materials for any state, um, such as Idaho, and you could go in and you can see the Idaho Code. I'm just used to using this, but I think that when it comes to the Idaho Code. You, you know, the same information is publicly available if you do a Google search for Idaho code or if you go to the Idaho legislature's website, I think you can access the entire code. Idaho statutes, um, Title 18 uh, are, is crimes and punishment. So this has it, this will uh, have a list of all state crimes and they're organized into different chapters. 
And one of the chapters has to do with protecting children. And so I think it's, it's like chapter, chapter 15 is children and vulnerable adults. Um, so if you scroll down, um, you'll see that there's obscene materials, dissemination to minors policy. So we've got 18-1513, 1514, 1515, and then 1516 and 1517. 1517 provides the defense and says that this is not going to be used against people um, in who are doing. Uh, I'll show you the exact language, but th this is the this is the statutory exemption. Um, disseminating material harmful to minors basically says it's a misdemeanor. You can get up to a year if you disseminate to a child material harmful to minors. Um, the definition here is where you get the, that's where the, the real action is going on. That's where they put in the statutory test that's supposed to satisfy the kind of Ginsburg Miller stuff. So here, I will open this in a separate tab. And then if I switch tabs, do you see me flip to the next tab? Uh, we're seeing 18, 15, 13. Yeah. Okay. So 1513 just declares the policy of the legislature that we want to restrain distribution of these materials to minors. Um, when you move to the next section, you get 1514, which provides definitions of obscene materials. Now, there was a question in the chat about why the definition is written in a certain way. And I think the answer has to do with when these statutes were written. So if you scroll down and look at the credits here, it looks like it was originally drafted in 1972 and then it was amended in 1976. You might recall that that case, the Miller case, uh, Miller versus California, where we get the test from, that was decided in 1973. And so I think what happened is that the Idaho legislature wrote the statute before Miller was decided. And then they amended the statute to try to make it track the decision of the court in Miller. And I think that's why if you look at the definition of harmful to minors, it says it includes in its meaning one or both of the following. And then it has A and B. I think B is what they what the Idaho legislature originally had before the Miller test. Um, which talked about the dominant effect of substantially arousing sexual desires in minors. That's what a lot of states had before Miller. Um, and Idaho might have thought before Miller that that was enough. And I think that after Miller was decided, they amended the statute and they added A. But at the time, remember, you had 13 opinions, you know, you had 13 cases where the 55 separate opinions, people weren't sure what the US Supreme Court was going to do. So I think they left it in here in case the court changed its mind. They kind of had a backup definition, which was a little easier to satisfy for prosecutors. And then they added this other definition that was harder to satisfy, but tracked the language in the, the Miller case. And you know, it does say or, which suggests that you could prosecute somebody under B. If if an Idaho prosecutor tried to prosecute somebody under B, I think the first question would be, is that consistent with the, the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Miller? And if it's not, then the prosecution would, would violate the First Amendment. And so I think that, you know, I think that the statute would be read in a way and would be used in a way that it applied the three-part test from Miller. And you can see, I think I've started color coding this for you, that um, this is basically the Miller test. It says, harm, as, it, as adopted to minors, like you're allowed to do in Ginsburg, right? So it says harmful to minors means, and if we focus on the A definition, which is really tracking Miller, um, it means that, description or representation of nudity, sexual conduct, sexual excitement, or sadomasochistic abuse. And then it says appeals to the prurient interest of minors as judged by the average person applying contemporary community standards. Um, and then it depicts and it describes what it needs to depict. 
and saying that it's patently offensive to prevailing standards in the adult community with respect to what's suitable for children. And then it provides some of those examples. This is directly from Miller of the sorts, the, the sorts of specific conduct that the statute's prohibiting. And then it says nothing here uh, is intended to prohibit stuff that when considered as a whole and in context possesses serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value for minors, according to prevailing standards in the adult community. Um, and so I think the, the 6A and 6B thing is kind of a relic of this being updated after Miller was passed. But then as for the question um, about statutory protection for librarians, you know, 1515 says it's a crime to give kids material harmful to minors. But then 1517 has different types of defenses. Some of the defenses involve if, if a 16 year old says they're 20 and gives you a, you know, a fake driver's license, then that might be a defense. But here, if the defendant was a bona fide school, college, university, museum, or public library, or uh, you know, a person acting in the capacity as an employee of such an organization, or then that is a defense. That's the protection that librarians have. Um, and in, in a lot of states, there's similar language that protects librarians. Um, and if you look at what happened this past legislative session, there were efforts to change this. Um, but that that was ultimately veto. Thanks for that. Um, so someone mentioned Mississippi. So they passed uh, some laws that were similar to the ones that were brought up in Idaho. And as a result, uh, some of the library systems are deciding that they cannot allow anyone under 18 to access ebooks in any fashion, just because the, the risk was too high, they decided. Um, and so the question was, do you feel like that might uh, spread? Um, so would that spread like predicting if other states will, will try to do similar things? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I mean, I could, I could totally see that spreading. Right. Um, you know, we seem to be at a moment right now in our our national public debate where uh, people are really concerned about what materials are um, available to children, what materials children can access through libraries. And so there's efforts to try to restrain uh, access. There, there's been a there's been a huge uptick. Right. Um, I don't know if there's there's much I can say uh, about exactly why we're in that moment right now, but I think empirically there's been a lot more in the last few years. There's been more efforts in lots of states to legislate access to materials at libraries. Um, I would note that I I think we're also going to see an increase in lawsuits challenging those sorts of statutes and testing whether those statutes comply with the First Amendment. Um, and so, and I think that just based on the discussion we've had today, um, you know, obviously not every ebook is gonna meet the statutory definition of obscene material. Not every ebook is gonna meet the statutory definition of harmful to minors, right? And so that law might be prohibiting kids access to some, uh, unprotected books, but it's also prohibiting their access to lots of books that are protected by the First Amendment. Um, and there's there's different legal tools that judges use to evaluate laws that kind of throw out the baby with the bathwater. They kind of, um, they go after unprotected speech, but in trying to go after unprotected speech, they end up capturing a lot of protected speech too. Um, and usually, you know, judges have different legal tests that they use to ask the question, you know, how much protected speech are, are you prohibiting here? And is there a way that you can be more tailored? 
Is there a way that you can really focus on the unprotected speech while still giving people access to the protected speech? Um, and it's not clear to me that something as blunt as an absolute prohibition on ebooks uh, will be considered uh, to be sufficiently tailored by a court. Now, let me put it this way. If this was for adults, I think it would be a slam dunk that you can't do that. I, I don't think the state could say adults can't access ebooks because some of those ebooks might have obscenity in them, right? Um, but I think that a similar argument could be made even when the, re the restriction is specifically targeting um, people under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many good questions. It's hard to pick. Uh, so yeah. there's a question about um, uh, since the value of these books or their obscenity is determined by a court, could a library uh, take a list of books to a court to get them like uh, pre-checked or uh, to a lawyer perhaps, uh, would that be a good strategy? Um, yeah, so that that's an excellent question, right? So part of the problem here is that the way that we ultimately decide if something uh, falls into one of these categories of obscenity or harmful to minors is we have a criminal jury trial and the jury has to make a decision. Um, nobody wants to go through a criminal trial, right? Um, if I was a librarian and a 13 year old came and wanted to take out a book and I thought there's a 5% chance I'm gonna have to go through a criminal trial, I'm gonna hesitate to provide that book to the kid. Even if not, there's a 95% chance there's not gonna be a trial. And even if there's a 95% chance that I would win the trial, right? This is what um, you know, courts and legal scholars call a chilling effect, where just the, the risk that maybe you could get in trouble, even if there's a low chance that you can get in trouble, will discourage you from doing stuff that's actually permitted, um, that's actually protected by the First Amendment, right? So you know, it's not as simple as there's just a pre-check system where you can just go to a court and say, here's our library catalog, can you please approve it, right? But um, what there is, is, um, you know, that, and that's why I think that it, it makes sense to have these sorts of uh, protections for librarians. Because, you know, the only books that librarians give to kids are books that are in the catalog, right? And when librarians give a book to a child at the library, they do it pursuant to the training they have at the library and the policies that they have at the library, right? And so if, if, if I'm a parent and I don't like that a particular book is being given to a particular child, it seems to me that the most straightforward way to address that is to engage with the policies that the library has uh, and and I'm not an expert in libraries, so I don't know if I'm using the right terms, but collection policies mm -hmm. about what books you have in the library, and then maybe circulation policies about, you know, what, you know, what happens. And I, I don't know the answer to this question. Like, I don't know what happens if like a kid just goes into a library and says, can I have a book, right? Um, I don't know if they need approval from a parent to get a library card. I don't know if there's some mechanism where a parent can say, don't, don't give my kid books without my permission, or let in some way, let me um, approve what books my kid gets. Something like, I don't know if there's some mechanism to do that. Um, but it seems to me that the, if the concern that parents have are that they don't want their kid to get uh, a, a book that they don't approve. Um, it seems to me that the appropriate way to address that concern is to engage with the library on um, if there's some proper role for parental approval in the process of taking out a book at the library. Um, 
and I see that this goes to a question, you know, what about, um, so, so they need approval for a library card, um, but it's up to the parent to control what their children check out, you know, so is there a way that, you know, so if I, my daughter is 11, um, she needs approval for me to get a library card. Can I then monitor what books she's taking out from the library? It depends on the library. Um, uh, some some school libraries, especially, are starting to set up uh, like a notification system so that parents right. can opt in to be let uh, known what their child is checking out when they check it out. Right. Right. And you in know, others, so you can you can log into their online account and see what they have um, checked out on their cat on their card. But it really depends because each library is so unique to its own community, um, and they set their own policies uh, and standards. So it, it it's really variable. Right. Um, yeah. So you know that that and I, and again, I'm just speaking for myself, right? Um, you know, that seems to me like those sorts of conversations seem to be about giving, empowering a parent to, um, to be able to, you know, decide with their child what materials they're going to access. Um, and it doesn't involve the risk of librarians getting in trouble or have to worry about criminal prosecution and it doesn't have a chilling effect that prevents other kids from accessing books that their parents are fine with them accessing right um so yeah i i do think that um Yeah, I think that there's, there has been empirically in the last few years, a big uptick in legislative activity in this area. Um, I think that there's already starting and I think there will continue to be an uptick in litigation responding to this, uh, questioning whether this legislation is going too far and whether it's consistent with, you know, with constitutional doctrine about First Amendment. Oh, we are running out of time, but there was one more question about are there precedents or protections for minors' rights to protected speech? Yeah, so um, that's an excellent question. The court has said a few times that the right to speech includes a right to hear and a right to read, a right to access information. Um, and they have suggested that that right might not just apply to adults. It might that children might have some right to access some information. Um, and then there was, this, there was this case called PICO that was from the 70s, um, but it was 70s, 80s, but it, it was about, uh, you know, parents wanted to, to ban certain books from school libraries. And children said, we don't want, um, you know, children said, we think we have a legal right to access some of these books. We don't think these books are obscene or harmful to minors. And we think that they, um, they, they have a right. Um, and you got a very divided opinion from the court. So there wasn't just one majority opinion, different justices said different things. And so there, there's an open question, um, to whether children, at least at some age have some right to access materials um even if their parents don't want them to even if their school doesn't want them to that's that's an i would say that's an open question of constitutional law and i put a link in there uh for more information about that case uh board of education v pico um it's got some good language in there yeah Cool. Well, we are after 12 o'clock. Uh, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So um, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I see we didn't get to all of your questions. Uh, so if it's OK with Benjamin, I was planning on, uh, you know, if you're in Idaho, 
uh, making available his email address so that you can reach out to him if you have uh, Idaho specific legal questions. But again, he's not providing legal advice, he's just providing information. Um, but thank you very much uh, for attending. As you exit the webinar, you're gonna get uh, a link to a survey. And we very much appreciate your honest feedback. Um, and I hope everyone has an excellent afternoon.